Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our discussion this evening, Conversations with CKG, our book discussion of The Explosive Child by Dr. Ross Green, the thesis of which is that behaviorally challenging kids lack important skills, especially flexibility, adaptability, frustration tolerance, and problem solving. This is why they explode or exhibit challenging behaviors when certain situations demand those skills. The Explosive Child provides a framework for understanding the neuroscience behind their difficulties, why traditional parenting models often don't work, and what to do instead. I'm Susan Lindsay, Director of Programs with the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation, and this is part of our Conversations with CKG discussion series, a community platform which seeks to turn the whispered hidden conversations about mental health into open, supportive educational dialogue. Thank you to Haley Dalton, who will be providing resource links in the chat and helping to manage our questions tonight. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A feature. We ask that you use Q&A to submit your questions. We will do our very best to get to as many questions as possible within the hour. A recording of tonight's conversation will be available on ckgconnections.com. We are joined by licensed marriage and family therapist, Ashley Morgan Sukup with Summit Emotional Health. Ashley works with children, adolescents, and adults specializing in post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma, marital concerns, anxiety and depression, ADHD, substance abuse, and behavioral concerns. Specifically, Ashley assists individuals and families in exploring new patterns of communication and engagement to support one another and promote long-lasting change within the family. Welcome, Ashley, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Excited to be here and happy, happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so Ashley, I love that you recommended this book. I found it immensely helpful as a parent and have already started practicing um, plan B and the ideas um, put forth in the book with my kids, one of whom is, it can be very explosive. Um, and I know we probably have lots of participants with questions about plan B. And we will definitely get to those. But Dr. Green sets up some important concepts at the beginning of the book that I'd like to start with. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in um, okay. with chapter one. So the waffle episode. Um, so this chapter describes a family's experience with their daughter who unexpectedly finds that there are not as many waffle, frozen waffles in the house as she thought. Um, and she wasn't going to be able to have as many waffles as she expected. And she just goes into a rage and explodes. Um, and I think that is very um, relatable, <laughs> probably for many of us. Um, and, you know, but what really stuck out to me about this chapter is that the mother uses the following phrases to describe her experience as the parent of an explosive child This is a nightmare. I'm emotionally spent. It makes me feel very alone. We are in a perpetual state of crisis. And I really appreciate that he started the book with a story um, because so many people can relate to it who have a child who is easily frustrated, struggles with problem solving and struggles to deviate from an expectation. And often an expectation that they just have in their head that they haven't even told anyone else about until you know that expectation is not met. And so as a parent, I immediately felt like, oh my gosh, I like someone gets the emotional toll that this takes on me and really on the entire family. So I wanted to start there with an acknowledgement that living in a perpetual state of crisis is exhausting and it's lonely. Um, and so I was wondering how you address this with parents who come into your office with a similar family dynamic. Absolutely, so I think the biggest, um, it's one word, validate. Um, so when these parent families come in, we want to validate them um, and really make them feel like they're heard and understood, which is very similar to when these kids are exploding. They have the idea, the preconceived notion in their head, the inability to transition from one task to the next, all these lagging skills. They don't understand what they're, what's going on for them, um, and they need the opportunity to feel heard and understood. Well, parents who are going through this too, they also need that feeling of being heard and understood and validate them and their concerns, their worries, their frustrations, and even their fears of this, is this ever gonna get any better? Um, and that's often something that I hear in my office and really letting parents know that it's not their fault. Like they didn't do anything to create this, um, but 
It's not that they're doing anything wrong. It's just, we need to come, come up with what to do different. And it's not what they need to do different. It's a little bit of what everybody in the family dynamic needs to do different because we're changing the relational piece. We're changing the communication patterns. We're changing the dynamic. Um, and then um, we will be able to make change. And often what that does is it takes the power away from the kid being the issue and it takes the power away from the parent being the problem. And it says, okay, like it's this entity over here that we need to solve and we need to fix. And then it takes away that, that frustration towards one another and that resentment towards one another. And do you involve siblings in that conversation? Yeah. So um, in standard practice for family therapy, the more people in the room, the better, um, because we get more information um, that way. Um, and oftentimes when these kids that come in, they, they are ashamed of their experiences. They are remorseful. They are embarrassed, whether they're showing it from, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to just disengage and act like I don't care about anything, or I'm going to cry, or I might explode because I can't handle the anxiety of what's happened and people talking about it. Um, so when you bring a sibling in, well, there's more people in the room. It takes the anxiety and the pressure and the tension off of one person or two people. Um, and then they can really give a lot of a perspective of what they're experiencing or what they're seeing. Um, and they can often be as a therapist, your biggest ally. Um, well, and I think it's important to note here at the very beginning that, um, not all children explode. And I actually read something that Dr. Green had written, um, you know, that I found online that like he kind of hesitated with the title of the book and, and clearly it is called The Explosive Child, but some children don't, don't explode, they implode or their emotional response, you know, isn't this outward outburst, you know, of, of rage or anger, um, but they still have the lagging skills and the problem solving issues. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, implosion might look like I'm going to um, sit silently at my desk or in my room and cry. I might run away and hide. So, you know, I have a kid that's an externalizer. He's six and he's the externalizer and he's going to cry or make big, loud emotional responses. My three-year-old, he runs away and hides his head in the couch and disappears. And then you have to go find him and ask him what's wrong. And that's the version of implosion versus the explosion. And sometimes the, the explosive child's easier because you at least know there's a problem where the implosive, like the imploding child, you might just think they're sad and then not really even know, or like, oh, they're going to go away and they're going to get it together. And then they come back and they act like they're fine. And then the problem's never fixed. Yeah, that's a great point. That's it. So I have, um, you know, just for those who don't know, I have twins, um, twin boys and I have one of each. I have one who's like <laughs> in and over here of explosive and then the like polar opposite over here who goes to his room and is really quiet. And it's like, you know, pulling teeth to get any information out of him about what's wrong. Um, and, and they, but it is two sides of the same coin, you know? Absolutely. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> coming through. Hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, that's all right. I can that's, tell you. That's eyes. never I'm happened laughing. before. <laughs> Woo, I'm not crying about the book. Nope. I wish I could give you some of my water. <laughs> Man. Okay. So, and so that kind of leads us, um, you know, we, we touched on a little bit about like judgment, parents judging themselves, which kind of leads us into chapter two. Um, you know, in chapter two, I have to admit, it felt like a little bit of a radical idea to me. So this chapter is about the fact that kids do well if they can. And right, so like on the face of hearing that, it's really easy to say like, yeah, of course, you know, like I totally agree with that. But to really like accept that notion, you have to leave behind the idea that children are explosive because they're stubborn willful, spoiled, controlling, resistant, unmotivated, out of control, defiant, or manipulative, trying to get their way. And you also have to leave behind the idea that your parenting is too passive, it's too permissive, that you're not setting enough boundaries, and that you're an inconsistent disciplinarian. And, you know, I, I will say for myself that I have thought all of those things, both about my child and about myself and my own parenting. 
And, but that's where the stigma is. That's where all the judgment is. And that's kind of the cultural norm of like, when we, you know, see that happening or if we're observing it with someone else's child, we, you know, we kind of think, well, like they need to set some boundaries, <laughs> you know, with, you know, it's just the cultural norm. But if we accept this idea that kids do well, if they can, then, and truly accept it, then we leave behind that stigma of both the parent and the child. Um, so I'm wondering if it's just me or if parents, you know, that come into your practice also find that kind of a radical idea to truly accept. I think they do. And, and you know, and some of that is really normal because when you look at kids from a developmental perspective, you know, they are always testing boundaries, right? Like that's how we gain information. And sometimes kids do test the boundary and it's with intention to see what the reaction is going to be. So then they know either I'm going to do that or I'm not going to do that. But that's really not what we're talking about with this book. It's those, those situations where they are incapable of being flexible. It's not that they have, um, when you use the word stubborn or I hear manipulative in my office all the time and I kind of, you know, I get to take a step back from the whole experience because I'm not in it. Um, and I, I say to myself, like, well, manipulative, I don't really believe that kids can be manipulative. I think that they, like, that would imply that they have malintent. And like, does a child in, enter into a situation or experience with malintent? More than likely, no. Um, it might be that they don't understand the severity of the situation. And we can take them out of the situation and then have the conversation and really understand from um, a curiosity perspective of what was going on for them or what they were trying to experience or what was happening. Um, we can recognize that like maybe they just thought about it a little bit differently or maybe they didn't recognize that it was going to be a big of an issue or they're exploding and they're they're That's not malintent. It's I'm exploding because I cannot contain my emotions um, in a way that feels productive or appropriate to me. Um, and one of the ways to really recognize that is when after the fact, looking at the reactions and then they, they calm down and then what is the behavior after? Are they tearful? Are they kind of, do they kind of go off and sit to themselves and kind of look like they're sad about it? Do they um, make jokes and act like it never really happened and try to be totally funny and act like it didn't happen so we could just move on? Um, and then how do we respond in those situations? And that gives them a lot of cues too of like, wow, they're really upset and then I made them angry, they must not like me. And guess what happens then? Our anxiety is gonna increase, we're gonna feel more stressed, we're gonna feel like we're not liked, and then we're more likely to explode or implode um, because we've had this negative perception about ourselves that might not even be reality. Right, and then it's a cycle. Well, and I can say, so I actually bought this book when um, my kids were probably about three too young <laughs> to use this book. And I put it away when I realized that. And then I just kind of forgot about it, honestly, until you said, hey, let's read this book. And I pulled it off my shelf. And it's so it's interesting to kind of look back and see where my kids are now and starting to use these methods. And that I, I do feel like, at, so my kids are 11, that they are starting to be able to verbalize and to verbalize that they don't like, you know, like I'm so, I'm so stupid. Like when he's in the throes of like being so frustrated and an outburst, which is really saying, I don't know how to control this. And I'm, I feel so bad that, that I'm having this reaction, but younger children can't articulate that. And probably sometimes older kids can't articulate that either. Absolutely. And one of the ways too, you can really know is people, kiddos might say like, don't talk about it. Like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want you, or they'll come into my office and be like, mom or dad, do not tell her about what happened or that didn't happen. And they deny it. And that's such an indicator that there's a lot of shame wrapped up in what they're experiencing or what's happening for them. Um, and then really coming and take, you know, my job is to take the non-judgmental stance of, you know, what is happening in those moments. And you can say or do anything. and I'm going to like you anyway. And that's a big piece of this. You know, a lot of times when the parents come in, I'll meet with them first. And I often ask them, like, do you like your child? Do you like them? And they get a little huffy and they'll say, well, like, of course I do. Like, I love them. And like, I know you love them. Do you like them? Because that's a whole different thing. And if you can take the, you know, get them to that place, they can often acknowledge, no, sometimes I don't like them in those moments or life has been so difficult or it's a nightmare you know, as the, the mom in the book explained that like, I'm very angry and I don't really like them a lot of the time. And that's where we had to strip that away because the kids are picking up on that. And then again, it leads to explosion or implosion. 
and really help the parents to identify, you don't have to like the behaviors. The kid itself is not bad, but they're bad behaviors and you do not have to like them, but that's what we're working together to try to fix and then help them to identify what about your child is likable. Like, what are those things? And when you're having those experiences that are really bad, that's what you need to draw on. Like, I need to find my patients. My frustration and tolerance is being tested because they explode over and over and over and over again. I'm out of it. Like, I don't have any steam to be able to manage this anymore. Okay, what's likable? What do I like? And that's where a plan C can come into place. If you know what? I don't have the bandwidth to deal with this. I'm not in a place to be able to handle this effectively because I'm really frustrated, really angry. I need to put this aside and not challenge it. Um, and take a step back so I can breathe and I can find out what's likable. Yeah, I love that. So one other thing that I found in this chapter, and he comes back to this several times throughout the book, is that explosive children rarely explode at school. Mm -hmm. So here's my train of thought as a parent um, that makes this so confusing. He, He can behave at school so he knows how to behave He has demonstrated he knows how to behave, so therefore he is choosing not to behave at home. That is like how my thought process has gone. Um, And so Dr. Green is saying in the book, that's that's not true, (laughs) that's not the case. That is not what is happening at all. It's that they're holding it together there's, you know, public shame of exploding in like a school setting or some other public setting. And so it is like, they are doing everything they can, you know, to hold it together at school. And then they come home and fall apart. And that is, so, you know, parents get very frustrated about that. And then the the natural response is, well, you're their safe place. Right. And parents get equally frustrated with me for saying, well, you're your safe place. So obviously, But then I often ask parents, where do you feel the safest? Like, when can you let your guard down? What does that look like? Nine times out of 10, it's at home with their family. Okay, well, that's what the kid's doing too. And they're looking at the parents that are the models. You know, we we are given children to guide them, to teach them, to teach them how to do things. That you teach them how to tie their shoes. You teach them how to like put on their clothes. You teach them how to brush their teeth. They're looking to you to say, teach me how to manage my feelings teach me how to model my, you know, handle my feelings and emotions appropriately, or learn how to transition from one thing to the next. I don't even know how to do that. And they're losing it. So you can teach them. They just don't know that's what they need. Right. And so the Dr. Green is saying these kids have lagging skills and there's a whole list on my book, we have different versions of the book. So in other people's books, it may be a different page, but in my book, it's page 38, 39. Mm-hmm. Um, Haley can put a link in the chat to, um, there's a PDF online, but it's an assessment of these lagging skills and unsolved problems. So we often, you know, totally accept it's the norm. We all accept that kids have develop, different developmental rates for reading and for maybe math concepts and spelling and coordination, those all come at different times. What we never hear anyone say, well, Susie, you know, my Susie, she has a developmental delay in problem solving, or, you know, Joey has a developmental delay in processing and managing his emotions. You know, that I've never heard anyone, you know, say that. Um, so can you speak to which of these lagging skills you see most often in your practice and why it's, it's kind of a hard concept to accept that like this behavior is because of lagging skills and some developmental delays emotionally. Absolutely. So um, if you have my version of the book, it looks like this, it's going to be on 258. um, And then just to blow it up, you can find the PDF online too. And that's what Haley put on. It'll look like this. So, and I think um, actually there's an updated version that looks even, (laughs) so there's multiple versions out there. It's all the same information though. So I will tell you, um, it was really, I was glad you brought this question up because when I looked through these, um, I highlighted the ones that also bring about more frustration and and negative interactions between parent and child. So difficulty handling transitions, shifting from one mindset or task to another. Well, guess what happens more often in the morning? You got to get up, put your shoes on, go brush your teeth, do your, you know, brush your hair, get your book back, go outside. We're transitioning from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And in there, they're tired. So they're not at their, their baseline. They're not at their best. They might be nervous about school. So they're not at their best. And we assume it as like, you're just being difficult, right? 
Like you're being a pain in the butt. We do this every morning. We have a routine like, okay, but the transition, particularly when you're lagging in your ability and lagging and fatigue or being hungry or nervous about whatever, it's going to make it more difficult. Well, when they have a struggle with transition, what does the parent do? We up the ante and we get frustrated too. And then we get exacerbated and then they get exacerbated rather than let's look at the problem. Um, another one, I, um, and this happens a lot with teens is poor sense of time. So they'll sit forever and do their homework and they don't even recognize that an hour has gone by or they've looked at their phone or, you know, they're watching a show and turns out to be like two hours of a show, not, you know, the 30 minutes that they said. Um, and it can feel really manipulative. I mean, that can feel really manipulative. I, I gave you time, set a timer. Well, for kids who are ADHD, and that's a pretty classic, you know, explosive children, that's all go hand in hand oftentimes with ADHD, what's happening? Like, they're not even aware that a timer's going on because they're so ingrained in what they're doing. So there's that piece of like, are they intentionally losing sense of time or are they and like choosing not to abide by your rules and not show up to dinner? Or is it that they're not aware of it? They're not aware of time. Um, and then not helping to figure out the solution to that. So important. Other ones, difficulty expressing concerns, needs, or thoughts in words, or difficulty understanding what's being said. It can often come across, particularly in middle school and high schoolers, as just being kind of snarky or rude. Like, I don't know, I don't care, um, or not talking at all, um, or why'd you ask me that question? And, you know, if you don't know, or you don't have the verbiage to something, you know, what are we gonna do? We're gonna probably compensate by being snarky rather than recognizing like, I, I really don't know the issue. And we often say like, I don't know. Well, we never take people when they say, I don't know us at face value. Um, this was an interesting reminder for me because, and I have like very few rules in therapy. Like you can pretty much do or say whatever you want. Um, so if they're coming in and they're saying, I don't know, I say, you can't say, I don't know in here. So it's teaching them, they have to say something different, but then I have to give them the space to do so. And then sometimes I even have to give them the language of what that can look like. So you don't know, okay, well, I'll wait. We can figure it out together. Why don't you try me on what you're thinking? And then we, I can help you find the terms or um, what's going through your head. Like, and it could be anything. Okay. Um, or this might be what I'm thinking about this. Is that accurate or no? Like give me it. Giving them a starting place. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Um, and there's another psychologist. He's awesome. Um, Dan Hughes. And he uses collaborative problem solving, um, Ross Green's approach a lot in therapy. And um, particularly with kids who are really struggling and they don't talk at all, he'll often say, I'm gonna be you for a second, is that okay? And you can even say that as a parent, I'm gonna be you for a second, is that okay? You give me the thumbs up if I'm right, thumbs down if I'm wrong, or like somewhere in the middle if I've sort of got it. And then you play it out. Like I can imagine like, it's pretty hard to get up in the morning and be able to think about having to put your shoes on and you don't really want to go to school. So why are you going to rush through it? Thumbs up or sort of, okay, sort of like, like you do want to go to school. You're just really tired or you're not tired. You just hate school. Um, like it must be really hard to have to do that. And then they give you the thumbs up or thumbs down. I like that. Yeah. Give them the space. So there's a lot of good ones. I mean, some, some of these are directly lagging skills are re directly related to certain diagnoses, anxiety, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD. So you might see that if your kid has a formal diagnosis. Um, but a lot of these also are just related to development um, and developmental stage, like transition time and transitioning from one task to another. That in, in early childhood and little kid stage, that's hard. And that has to be taught at an early stage. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. So I have to set timers all the time. I have to prompt them all the time. I have to be proactive all the time of, I'm not going to turn the TV on in the morning um, before you get ready. Um, and I have to be proactive in explaining that before they come down and turn the TV on and then I turn it off and they get mad at me. And right. And then there's like, psh, yeah. Exclusion. yeah. Well, and I think it's a good reminder that, you know, all kids develop at their own rate. So I think when you have multiple kids, it's really easy to compare. And, you know, with twins, we've always tried so hard not to ever compare, you know, but I have one who could probably be living on his own. He's so responsible, <laughs> like gets himself ready, cook his meals, like, you know, and then the other one is like, I have to remind you every single morning to brush your teeth. And it's, so it's so frustrating because when you have that 
dichotomy that's so different and far apart, you know, you, you kind of start thinking, oh, this one over here should be at this one's level. Mm -hmm. And, but they're their own people. We can't compare them. When our, our job as parents is to meet them where they are. And like, that can be really difficult, but I like view it as like some more often than not, you're dragging a kid along until they can like get the training, even get the training wheels on the bike, right? Like we're, we're pushing the bike or we're pulling the bike. Then they got to get the training wheels. And then we have to kind of make, keep those on for a while before they can take the training wheels off. And even then we don't take our hand off the bike. And like, I think if the, the idea of should or would or could or wish, like let's focus on where they are and then assess what they need. Right. Like you have to parent the child you have, not the one that you thought you had or wished you had or you know imagined you would have had or yeah right and the and the part that I want to validate parents is that takes an immense amount of patience because you're busy and you got a lot going on and like man why can't they just get it that they need to brush their teeth every morning and it's okay for you to be frustrated about that you're allowed to be upset about that you're allowed to be frustrated you need to give your permission self permission to do so so then you can process that and then remind them the next morning to brush your teeth <laughs> again with patience yes <laughs> so. yeah, we do have a question in the chat or in the q a that's sort of along that same vein of skill development um i think it was a, a little bit spurred by susan you mentioned that when when you got the book your your twins were three and i think that the attendees wondering when do the concepts of this book start really applying like does the book assume that there is a certain age when all kids are working on these skills and are therefore not quote unquote explosive children but just kids at a normal level of skill development for their age well that's a great question and before uh, ashley will give a great answer um <laughs> i'm sure but i do want to say you know when i bought it it's when they were three I, you know, everybody is like, oh, the terrible twos, it's really the terrible threes. And, you know, oh, I'm dealing with this with my kids too. But I knew even then that this was not a, a average level of emotion that was being expressed. Um, and partially because I had another child exactly the same age who wasn't behaving that way. So I feel like I knew very early when they were very young, um, that there was something else going on with this child, but I'll let Ashley um, answer. It's a great question. Yeah, so I think in terms of um, the idea of this book not being geared towards little kids, um, a lot of the, the examples in the book are related to middle school, high school age, um, and are even late elementary. Um, and the idea of like the twos and threes, really like terrible twos and threes, like it's a stereotype or a generalization for a reason because kids don't have frustration tolerance in those moments like that's when they're learning it and then really like if they don't come out of it and like they're having a hard time in kindergarten first grade second grade and it's becoming an issue where it's like impeding their daily functioning impeding their ability to engage with friends and peer groups impeding their ability to engage in sporting events or activities or you know all of the things that you would want them as they mature developmentally to be able to engage in, that's when you know it's a problem. Um, and, 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 you know, we hold three-year-olds' hands on things a lot. Um, we hold hands for two, three, four, and then even five-year-olds, we do some, but then, like, I think there's this, like, social expectation that once you launch into, you know, five, six, seven-year-old age, that, like, you're, you're supposed to acquire this maturity um, but that's implying that everybody you hit an age cut off and then developmentally they're in a space that they're going to have frustration tolerance. They're going to be more flexible and kids personality wise, they just might not be. And that's, I think what you saw with your twins, you know, that's what people see with siblings all the time. Some hit it at a certain age and some do not. And what do we need to give them in those moments to teach those skills at an older age where it's more age appropriate that they can understand the concept of frustration tolerance or they can understand how to be flexible. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know if that answer made sense, but. I think so. Let us know if you have any follow-up um, questions to that. So in chapter four, he um, gives a lot of examples of like what this looks like in different families and with different kids. Um, and I, I really liked his examples. I thought that they were realistic and relatable. Um, and one that really made me pause was Danny. Um, in my book, it's on page 58 but the parents are adamant that Danny needs to be punished for swearing 
and at his mother and trying to kick her. So as most of us, I'm sure if our <laughs> kids behave that way towards us, we would also be adamant they need to be punished. And it gave me pause because the therapist asked, despite all the punishing, he's still very physically and uh, verbally aggressive, right? And they respond, yes. And the therapist says, well, I'm not sure punishment makes sense just for the sake of punishment. And it really made me stop and think about like, what is the point of punishment and how do we step back and assess when punishment has just become an unproductive, ineffective cycle that we're in, um, when it really has become like punish, you shouldn't do this, so I'm gonna punish you, but uh, nothing's changing and, and it's not really effective. Mm -hmm. So um, in the conversations that we're gonna be having about consequences, reinforcement, punishment, I have a hard time with these chapters. And I think part of it is because the book is so targeted for children who struggle with explosiveness or um, inflexibility, it implies, I felt like in these chapters, it implies that no amount of consequencing or no amount of positive reinforcement um, works. And I strongly believe that that's not the case. And even with kids who um, struggle with explosiveness, there's pieces of them or their behaviors that they would do very well with positive reinforcement or do very well with consequences. Um, and then there's things that when they have the lagging skill or the unsolved problem, that's when, you know, it's so impulsive, it's so reactionary, um, it's so they're happening without them thinking, or like even like, like a calculation in their head of I shouldn't do that, that that's where the consequences don't work. Like if I take a timeout every, give them a timeout every time or take their phone away every time, well, when their thing is their flip gets switched that they feel like they're being hurt or they're scared or they're anxious or they're worried about something, their snap reaction is to hit or to curse like Danny, like it's hard to turn that off and the consequences are going to help if we can't get to the underlying piece of like what's happening. Um, I think in these situations and with Danny, um, I don't think it's inappropriate to give a space to time out in that. It's just how is that delivered? You know, like you're punished, go to your room is very different than Hey, Danny, you know what? I can tell you're really upset. And like, it hurts my feelings when you say that those things to me or you hit me. So like, I think we both need a break. That feels very different than go to your room. I'm done. I'm not talking to you. Stay there until dinner. And like, he's like, okay. And then next time he's going to do it, where if we can give the safe space, we're modeling, then I need a break and I'm going to do it in a way that's healthy. I'm going to ask for it in a way that's healthy. And then you come back and have the conversation when everybody's calmed down that's a different experience. Yeah. So I love the term um, reciprocal inflexibility <laughs> that uh, Dr. Green uses and that we are often as parents models, role models of inflexibility. And I think that it is human nature. It's like, you, you know, when there's so much anger and emotion being directed towards you, it's really difficult to not react in kind. Mm -hmm. um, but really, when we do react in kind with our own frustration and emotion, then we really are, it's just reciprocal inflexibility. We're just modeling the behavior that we don't want. Yeah, we're teaching the kid to up the ante. Like, okay, you're going to make me mad. Well, then I'm going to make you really mad. Okay, I made you really mad. Now you can react and then I'm going to really get you. And who's going to win? And it's the, the, the concept of like hurt people, comma, hurt people. Well, that's what we're doing, but we're, it's with their child. And there's a power dynamic there that they're never going to win. Like you might feel like they won because they got you to a place where you exploded, but like nobody's winning. Like they're not learning anything. You're not gaining anything from the experience. And it's going back to not, I'm going to fix it in this moment. And I'm going to make you hear me. It's we are both not being heard. And like, I need to figure out what's happening. Like what is happening? Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into the plans, because this is really like the meat of, mm -hmm. you know, how, how to parent differently. Mm -hmm. um, so for those who may not have read the book, can you give us a quick overview of plan A, B, and C, and then we'll focus on plan B, which, um, spoiler alert, is the one where <laughs> it's like the new method to use. <laughs> yes. Um, so in terms of plan A, yes, um, it's like the book because I said so. So, and I will be honest, when I get frustrated in the morning and they haven't put their shoes on again, I always say, you know what? Tomorrow, because you guys didn't put your shoes on the way you're supposed to, and now we're late again, I am, we are not turning the TV on until you get your stuff on. And that's plan A, right? 
And like, that is where they're like, okay, whatever. And then they wake up the next morning and either I'm going to turn the TV off. It's totally out of the, or the routine. And then they're really upset. Right. And then we have a complete meltdown versus plan B, which is being able to proactively have the conversation, which is not in the morning after they didn't do their stuff or not um, right like in the heat of the moment, being able to say maybe even out in the afternoon, like, you know what, we keep getting in arguments in the morning and I'm leaving upset and then I feel bad because I'm yelling at you to get your stuff on and because we're late, like we're not getting out of the door in time. And I think we need to come up with a way to like fix that. What's going on? Um, and practicing empathy, like what's happening? And the term they use in the explosive child is what's up. I would, I don't say what's up to my kid. I never really use that terminology. So when we're using the empathy piece and asking like what's going on or like I've noticed that use your language or they're going to feel really confused and uncomfortable. Um, and you can kind of pick the nuance. You know how you guys communicate with your kids. Um, and more often than not, I'm like, hey, this morning was kind of a mess and like I'm having a hard time with it. Like what happened? And then like express the curiosity and then they kind of get it like, oh, wow, we're talking about something rather than mom being angry. Um, and then you define the problem. Um, and then you give the invitation of, can we, that's the opportunity and plan B to really like come up with a solution and work together. And that's the collaboration. Like we are a team. And I often use that language, even with little kids of like our job and like it's the psychoeducation, you know, I'm your mom and I love you and I guide you on things, but also like in these opportunities where we're not getting along or we're having a hard time coming up with something, we're a team and we need to work together. Like our family is a team. Can you help me? help me. And that gives them a sense of perceived sense of control to figure out how to fix this. And then they get that kind of like internal, like power of like, okay, like I can do that. And like, mom's going to like, hear me in this. Um, as you become a teenager and you get a little bit older, they have perceived kind of preconceived notions of how you're going to react. And I'm not going to do that. So you really have to give a lot of patience and grace and like disarming them of like, you really can talk to me about whatever and I'm going to listen and I'm not going to react in a negative way. And I can imagine that you are probably worried that I might flip out or get upset or tell you that's wrong or preach at you or, you know, whatever the issue is. And I'm going to work really hard not to do that. And oh, tell me when I'm doing that, um, that kind of thing. So plan B, you give empathy of like, this was really hard or I noticed this ha is happening, what's going on. And then the defining the problem. So I'm hearing you say X, Y, and Z, and you drill down and ask lots of different questions about it. Um, and then you give the invitation of like, can we work on this together? Is this something we can do? Um, one of the things that's really funny, and I think somebody wrote in a question about this, of uh, when you are defining the problem and you're saying, they'll say like, uh, we could look for an example in the book. Um, you know, let me find you it. To read it. Do you want me to read the question that came in? Yeah, that would be great. Um, so uh, we got this email um, today. It says, when attempting to empathize with my child, who's nine, he immediately explodes. That's in all caps. That's what I've been saying. Are you too stupid to listen? So I try to find out what the problem is by directly asking, and I get yelled at about never listening. I ask him to help me come up with ideas to solve whatever the problem is. He yells at me that he has no idea what to do. He's just a kid. How can I get into doing plan B? Yeah, so I um, I was first introduced to this book when I was like in grad school and worked in my residency and it was in a residential treatment program with kids who they couldn't live at home any longer because they were having significant emotional behavioral issues. And I would do what this, this mom said and the example in the book, I noticed we've been struggling a lot over homework lately, what's up? Um, I would say what's happening, what's going on? It's too hard. And then the parent says, it's too hard. What part is too hard? It's too much. It's too much. Like, and the kids, it would happen. Why are you repeating everything I'm saying? Stop, stop doing that. You're annoying me. Like you're not listening. And it can come across like you're not listening. Like use some, like we, use your language as a parent to like respond to your kids. Like it's too hard. Okay, what's hard about it? Or that sucks. Or that's depending on how old they are. Or that's a bummer. Like what's too hard about it? Like. Why is it hard? Um, and then ask the question, you don't have to repeat everything they say ad nauseum because that would, I mean, that would be frustrating for me if somebody did that every time I was talking to them. Um, just kind of speed it along. They are quick thinkers. Um, you know, if they're acknowledging they, that makes them feel dumb, then maybe it does. Um, and then I would 
if, if my kid responded that way, rather than shutting down and session, I would say, I'm sorry, I made you feel stupid. That wasn't my intention. Like, and just address it and eat a little bit of crow. Like eating crow, just acknowledge, take accountability for what, what they perceive that you did, even if you didn't mean to. I'm really sorry I made you feel that like, can we try again? I wondered if um, perhaps she was jumping into plan B like right after the explosion, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, I could totally see this reaction and maybe like giving some time coming back to it in an hour or two, like when the emotion is gone, um, if there would be less of a reaction. Possibly, possibly. And I think, um, but there's often those kids too, who the minute you bring something up, it's a reaction. Yeah. Like they're anticipating the fight. Like they're anticipating the argument, they're anticipating feeling. And that's where they really don't like themselves inside, right? Like they feel really bad about themselves. So anytime you bring up something, they perceive it as critical and then they're reactionary, right? I think you have to disarm them of like, I'm having a hard time about this. Like I'm struggling, can you help me understand can you help me fix this? I think I'm doing something wrong. Like if you take ownership with it, like you're giving them a lot of perceived sense of control and power and it disarms them from feeling like they're on the defense. Then they're on the offense. People innately want to help one another. That's your kids too. They want to help you if you say you have a problem. They just don't want to be the problem. <laughs> so, and I, and I do with like a lot of times with this emergency plan B, and then proactive plan B, I'm thinking about like our society today, we're all so busy. Like the idea of going, okay, like I'm gonna intentionally now have a conversation in the hour that I had to relax about this so I can prep. That is not necessarily like realistic, right? It's hard. So, but I think knowing if that's the intent and that's the goal, right? Like even if you're using emergency plan B, it could, it's gonna work. It's just gonna take more time right? We're going to like really be riding on the training wheels, maybe a little bit longer. And that's where you have to give yourself some grace. Like it didn't work this time. And I know why it didn't work, but I'm going to keep kind of plugging away. Um, and we're all about consistency and structure and boundaries. Even if it starts out looking muddy, if you're consistent within those moments and those emergency moments, using the same language, stopping and taking a breath, having the conversations, defining the problem, they'll get it. They'll get it. It's just going to take a little bit longer. And then plan C is basically picking your battles. And this is not a battle, like setting it aside and not even addressing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can, that is one that I think can be really preemptive. Um, and I use the example of food a lot. A lot of times people come in and they'll say, you know, my kids aren't eating, like they need to eat everything on their plate and like they won't eat their peas. And it's like, well, why are we making that a thing? Or like, if you know they don't like peas, why are you making peas? It's like, why is that a rule? Um, and just understanding like, you know, why put in like these preconceived situations of control and control mechanisms that you know is gonna cause a reaction um, if you don't have to. Um, and the big thing in therapy too, is you pick two or three things you wanna work out on at a time, like the biggest ones and then let the rest go. Um, and intentionally try not to engage in those and the kids will like, they're not, they're not wanting to fight and then you're not on them all the time. So it feels a little bit better. It just kind of like calms everything down a bit. Well, they need opportunities to feel like there's positive interaction. And if we're on them for every little thing, and a lot of times kids that are explosive like this, they could get in trouble for every little moment, right? But if we're on them all the time, we're just breaking down their confidences. They're making, we're making them feel bad about themselves. And then we're never giving you or them an opportunity to feel liked. Yeah. So we would love to hear from folks if you have questions about plan B, about how to implement plan B, if there's like a particular step that you get caught up on every time. Um, do you struggle with a child that always answers? I don't know. Um, so please, um, you can either raise your hand, that little hand, and Haley can unmute you um, if you'd like to ask your question out loud um, or type it into the Q&A. I will share that I used plan B um, last week 
and I unexpectedly used it on the ended up at the end of the whole conversation was using it on the child who had not exploded. <laughs> <laughs> that it was on the other child, you know, who like his behavior was the unsolved problem. And it was not what I expected at all when I started. And I, you know, was like, I'm going to keep my calm and I'm, you know, I'm going to be empathetic. And we, you know, and then when we sat down, all three of us together, my two kids and I, and brainstormed, it ended up that like the child that had not exploded, it was his behavior you know, and it's a behavior like he ignores, like you speak to him and he ignores you and it drives his brother crazy. And it had happened in relation to something that made him really mad. And it, you know, and he, he does it to all of us because I think he's a little in his own world sometimes. And, but he does it the worst with his brother, you know, I mean, he just flat out will ignore him. And, um, so it was just really surprising and an interest. It made me step back and look at the dynamic, the whole dynamic of the family and the siblings. Um, and that maybe like we tend, you know, we tend to be like, oh, that's the that child, that's the child that is like the tough child and um, to deal with. But it, it ended up being the other one that needed to change his behavior a little bit. Um, that's I, a good, that's a good one. Oh, sorry, Haley, we have a question. I know you're good. I do see one question in the chat um, from a parent who says that their son repeatedly answers with a noun. So for example, the parent will say something and then her son will say tree and the parent will say something again and her son will say tree again and on and on. So do you, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, so um, this might be a good example of testing a boundary to see the reaction and I'm gonna wait for the explosion so then I can like retreat um, or so, a lot of times when kids do this, it's very similar when in sessions when they might say like, I don't know, over and over and over. And I'll say, I wait, I'll wait. I got all day. Like we can do this all day long. I'll wait with you. And then I go about my business. I might start taking notes. I'll stare at them and I'll sit in silence. And silence is a really great weapon because people are totally uncomfortable with it. And if you wait and wait and wait and wait, like eventually they're going to talk because they can't get up. And then you can say, sit back down. We'll wait. We got all day. And then you wait them out using very little affect. Like, don't act like he's bothering you because he wants to bother you. Like, I'll wait. I got all day long. And I kind of laugh. Sometimes I even look at my, my watch. I'm like, I got people I can cancel. It's no big deal. <laughs> and then they get, a, they're like, oh, okay, I'm not going to get to her. Like, you have to work hard, smarter, not harder. He's a triplet and you don't have all day long. I get it. So then you have to decide, are you going to let it, that, that you have to let him know, um, I'm gonna go away, but this isn't over. And that's the plan C of like, we're coming back to this so you can keep answering tree and that's fine. Um, but at the end of the day, you're only hurting you buddy. You're not hurting me. And I wait all day long and I'm gonna keep working through this because I do love you and I do care about you. Um, and then go about your day and then come back and say, are you ready to have that conversation? No? Okay, well, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep working on you. And that's your version of waiting. It's just you're going to do it over planting the seeds and then giving a little bit of, you know, over, over quite a bit of time. Any other, any other like plan B challenges? That's a tough one. That's a really tough one. Um, one, one that we struggle with, or I see often in sessions, um, is um, their inflexibility or their inability to bend. So if you are, you know, the idea of collaborative problem solving, you're working on a solution, but they're not willing to bend and work, come to the middle of what a proposed solution that you feel comfortable with, they're not gonna do that. That's a hard one. Um, and I think with those moments, they either might not have an idea of how to bend or they can't come up with potential solutions that both of you are work willing to work on together. Um, so you can name them like, hey, this is, these are some of the ideas that, that I've thought and give, make sure you're giving choices or things that you are willing to concede to. Um, and then at the end of the day, and this is kind of like plan B of like, all right, listen, if you're not willing to like come up with something, here are the choices and you got to pick one. So like, you can sit here and watch TV all day and not do your homework, 
but at the, then you're going to lose X or then you are going to like not be able to go to baseball or then you're not going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And then there's a perceived sense of control of that. And I all, I'll say that like you are in charge of this decision. You are in control of this decision. You just have to pick between the two options and they'll either a come up with a whole different option that they are, you're willing to like work on it with. They'll give you a little bit that you can draw from or they'll pick one. They might be mad about what they're picking, but they'll pick one. Do you want to touch on how to adapt these methods on for age? Um, like, are, are there things you would do differently with, say, elementary age children versus middle or high school children? Yeah, so, um, and I would say this, I would say this pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, I would say that young children lack the opportunity, the ability um, for emotional identification and the ability to identify their emotions way more than middle school and high school students. And since COVID, I would say that that's absolutely not the case that most children um, struggle with being able to identify their feelings other than happy, sad, or mad. Um, so with that being said, if you're having a hard time and little kids in particular, like you want to name for them things and you are going to do the majority of the work. Like what's happening for you? You're upset. It sounds like, are you mad, sad, scared, worried, happy, frustrated, lonely, disappointed? Like you're going to name them. And then they'll say, they'll pick one. They'll be like, okay, why is that? What's happening for you in that moment? Why does that make you feel that way? Um, that's horrible. Like validate them. And then they'll keep going of like, what's happening? Does that make you happy, sad, mad, scared, worried, lonely, disappointed? And then when that happens, what do you do? Because they're not even picking up when they're that little. They might react and not even realize they did it. Like kids get upset, get really angry. They run away and they hit someone. Like if they're in such like a blind rage and frustrated, they will look at you and say, I didn't hit somebody. And they mean it. Like they do not recognize that they hit somebody. And that's like, that's where you did hit someone. This happened. What happened for you? You're really angry. Like, okay, what are you angry about? What's happening? Are you just angry? Are you happy, sad, mad, scared, worried, lonely? Why? Um, and sometimes if they tell you, they can't tell you the emotion, they might tell you what happened or that, you know, the thought Then I will often say, you know, that would make me feel really sad. If I felt that way, I could only imagine how you would feel. Um, and then the, the teenagers, middle school, they're like, yeah, it did make me sad. Or that made me really disappointed. I would have felt disappointed. Is that how you feel? Um, and give them the language to be able to process it. Um, one last thing I wanna be sure that we touch on um, as we're getting to the end of our hour is the concept that when it comes to siblings, fair is not always equal. I think that is a really tough concept for both parents, but especially for the siblings. Yes, um, that's a really, really hard one and doing a lot of family work. I often work with a lot of siblings who in high conflict families and they're like the hero, the like, if you're looking at dysfunctional family roles, like they're the hero or they're like the easy one. Um, and I think fair is not always equal, but they need to feel like something's fair. And if they are the one that's always doing really great, they do repeat more, the majority of children respond really well again to consequences and rewards. Um, they just might not be the kids in this book, right? But if they're a really good kid and they're not the ones that are struggling, they are going to respond well to validating how well they're doing, providing them rewards and response, like benefits for being the responsible one for doing the right thing. Um, and I think, so focus on that. You want to reward their efforts. And I think because they're the easy one, a lot of times they're the ones that are the most invisible and that's not really fair either. Um, so just be mindful of it. Also too, when you have a kid that's really, really difficult in the family, um, they do take a lot of the focus of attention and it's really, really stressful for everybody. Um, if the parents are having a hard time being, you know, with managing their own stress and feelings of being overwhelmed or frustration tolerance with that, well, can you imagine how the sibling's doing because they don't have the same capacity for frustration tolerance as an adult and needing to give them opportunities and breaks away from the other child. Like whether that's an outing with a grandparent, um, a play date with a friend, time with you, you know, kind of give them opportunities to be able to go do their own thing and be away from the frustration. Speaking of those sort of family dynamics, um, we, we have a question 
what do you do about your teen who seems to hate you and refuses to do anything with you or the family? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a hard one. Um, I think kids who are struggling, kids innately do not hate their parents, right? They need things from their parents. They just might not necessarily know what they need. Um, so they are pushing you away. They are um, in a place where they're trying to set boundaries and they need to know that you're always going to be there. So if you say, you know what, like they're screaming, get out, leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you about it. You can say, okay, I'm going to give you the space that you need and I'm going to let you calm down, but I do love you and I care about you. And I want to talk to you about it. Like they're looking for the negative reaction. And more often than not, when kids are saying stuff like that, they are hurting and they want you to see, to see you, to see that they're hurting. So they're going to hurt you to push you away and then go, oh yeah, see, this is why I feel bad inside. Like mom left or dad bailed or people are screaming and yelling at me. See, you're the reason why I'm having a hard time. And that's not the case. So you, if you can deescalate of, I know you're hurting. I know you're having a hard time. I love you and I care about you. I'm going to give you the space, but guess what? I'm your mom. And like, I'm going to always be here. And I am going to come back to check on you because I love you. It's disarming that piece of like, we're yelling and we're arguing and we're angry. Um, and again, to think about what we're, how we are coming into the situation or approaching the situation. Like if in past history, it's we're coming in to tell them that they've done something wrong or, you know, we need to talk about this or we need to fix X or, you know, they need oftentimes too, you know, negative, a negative interaction needs seven positive interactions. We need the equal amount of times of coming into the room or engaging that are just quality of like, Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's up? Like, Hey, I did this today at, at work. This is what happened. I saw this on TV, like those quality, like mundane weather topic interactions for every one negative, you're going to need seven positive. I'm looking at the Q and A. That's really hard. And I think with the piece of, I don't trust you anymore, your reaction is going to be, I'm always going to love you. And I recognize that. And what can I do? What's, what can I do to support you? So you can trust me. How can I help you with that? And I want to, and I'm sorry, you don't trust me. And I'm sorry. I might've engaged. And even if you haven't, even if you haven't, I am sorry that I've engaged in behaviors that you feel like have breached your trust. What can I do to support you in that? And again, as the parent, perceived sense of control for the kid. I'm going to take on an overwhelming amount of responsibility as the parent because I can manage that to then give them a little bit of an opportunity to like have a perceived sense of control to disarm the situation. You're not taking on taking full responsibility. The intent is I'm going to disarm the situation by taking on the responsibility so they can then understand, hey, you know, mom's going to start talking to me. And then you can get to the place of like having the interaction. We are out of time. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for all the questions and participation tonight. Um, we hope that you leave this evening with a few more tools in your toolbox for supporting the teen in your life. Um, look for an email in the coming days with a link to the recording of the event, as well as a list of additional resources on the topic. Dr. Green has a whole website um, of great resources. There's a whole section for parents and families. So we'll include those links in the email. Our next conversation with CKG is April 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We will be discussing disordered eating and body image struggles among teens. So disordered eating is a term used to describe a variety of irregular eating behaviors, which may or may not fit the narrow criteria of an eating disorder diagnosis. Um, so we will learn how these behaviors may lead to more problematic eating disorders and put individuals at risk of serious health concerns. We'll discuss warning signs, how best to support someone who is struggling and resources for help. We also have our first teen edition of Conversations with CKG that is specifically for teens, April 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Am I okay? Signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety. And we surveyed um, teens in our speak up clubs across the greater Richmond area. And this was clearly their first choice of a topic. So, um, you know, we know that they know like, book in school, you know, in health class, what depression and anxiety is, we feel like they are asking, you know, do, do I have depression and anxiety? 
Um, so that's what that topic will be about. So um, help us spread the word and we hope to see you um, April 21st or your teen on April 28th. So thank you again and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.